I, I'm happy and pleased to introduce our guest speaker for today, who is Keith Bechtel. Uh, Keith works at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he's also uh, very deeply involved in studying the part of the universe that we can't see, the things that are not made of atoms. And uh, I'm very pleased that Keith agreed to speak with us. I think Keith is an excellent speaker. He also is a teacher like you, and so certainly understands the needs of the classroom. So with no further ado, I'm gonna let Keith take it away. And thank you, Keith. Great, uh, thank you for the introduction, Artis. Uh, can people see the this presentation screen? That looks good. Okay, uh, so I understand it's, it's probably a, uh, a broad range in the, in the audience today. So my goals are to give some scientific context for uh, understanding the Hubble diagram, which is uh, gonna be the activity uh, that's, that's shown later, uh, and why, why this is interesting, and how, uh, just very briefly, how the Rubin Observatory can contribute to that effort. So let's begin. So we live in an expanding universe, and this is a visualization to try to, uh, one, one way of seeing what an expanding universe might look like. So each of these points uh, is representing the location of a galaxy, uh, the colors are just uh, to ident identify the different galaxies. And we can imagine uh, that we live in one of these galaxies, for example, this blue circle uh, highlighting the, the red galaxy here. And what we can imagine is that if, if the universe is expanding, then we can take a snapshot uh, at, a, at a different time in the history of the universe when the universe was a little bit smaller. Sort of overload here is basically the same set of galaxies but when the universe was just a few percent smaller than it, than it is today. And what we'll do is it will basically shift how, how this, uh, this set of galaxies would look if we were to shift the perspective uh, to different galaxies. So first thing you'll notice is that this differential between the locations of the galaxies, as you get further away from the, the current galaxy marked with the blue circle, that differential is increasing, meaning that the, that the galaxies appear to be moving away faster. But if we imagine shifting the perspective uh, to other galaxies, uh, we see that in this expanding universe, effectively all the galaxies would have the same impression uh, that it looks like the galaxies are moving away from them. And uh, that as you look at galaxies that are further away, they appear to be receding uh, at a faster rate. So this is one way to, to visualize what we mean by an expanding universe, that the, uh, the, the typical distances between galaxies is growing with time. And so if we were to try to create some mathematical relationship uh, between uh, the distances to nearby galaxies or, or far away galaxies, some indication of their distance, and then the apparent uh, recession speed, uh, what we would predict in an expanding universe uh, is that there'd be this linear relationship where the galaxies that are further away from us uh, appear to be moving away at a faster rate. Uh, and that's because the overall scale of the universe is, is increasing with time. So this is what we would predict theoretically. And oops, if I go forward, uh, this was actually uh, observed experimentally. Uh, the first Hubble diagram was made uh, around 1929. Uh, this is basically Hubble combining the spectroscopic information uh, collected by Vesto Slipher, uh, looking at, at nearby galaxies and the, their apparent motion uh, away from us as measured by looking at their spectral lines. And then the period luminosity relationship from Henrietta Leavitt uh, that could calibrate the luminosities of Cepheid stars and those, uh, those galaxies and use that to estimate the distance. So it's turned out that the initial uh, estimate of the expansion rate estimated by Hubble was off by almost a factor of 10. Um, the, the modern uh, measured value for the expansion rate today, basically at, at right now in the history of the universe, uh, it's about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And a way to think about this is that a galaxy that is one megaparsec away, about 300 million light years away, uh, this is approximately the distance to the, to the nearest large galaxy, to the Milky Way Andromeda, uh, would appear to be moving away at about 70 kilometers per second. Um, and so this is, this is sort of the statistical uh, relationship that we would expect as we look at galaxies that are further away, uh, they would appear to be moving 
away faster uh, at this linear rate. Now there's actually two different contributions uh, to an apparent wavelength, uh, wavelength shift. Uh, so this would be, for example, the, the red shift, how, how quickly a galaxy appears to be moving away based on its shifted spectral lines, for example. So one uh, contribution comes from the relativistic Doppler effect. And this, uh, this arises uh, from special relativity. And it's actually something that's used to measure, for example, uh, the speeds of a tennis ball or a baseball uh, in sports. Uh, the relativistic Doppler effect can be used uh, to tell us the relative velocity between an emitter and an observer. There's a second uh, effect uh, which contributes to an apparent wavelength shift, which is the cosmological redshift. And this uh, is related to the relative size of the universe when the light was emitted and when it was received. And in fact, if you measure this, this wavelength shift, uh, you can tell what the size of the universe was when the light was emitted. It turns out that the cosmological redshift uh, is the dominant effect when we look at galaxies that are further away than say 100 uh, million light years. So basically once, once we stop looking beyond our immediate neighborhood of nearby galaxies, uh, this cosmological redshift is, is the larger effect. Um, and this, uh, this is what we, how we interpret the, the overall uh, recession of all the galaxies that we see in the observable universe. You could imagine trying to explain uh, that effect with the relativistic Doppler effect, but actually would be quite a contrived situation because you'd have to imagine that all the galaxies somehow coordinated to, to move away uh, at the exact right velocity. And so uh, the cosmological redshift is a much more natural answer. And this, this is evidence for the expanding universe. So one way that we can try to understand the expansion history of the universe is to uh, look for supernova explosions. And so I think uh, probably Federica talked about this a bit, a bit yesterday. So the idea is that as, as you're observing uh, the night sky, you return to the same patch of sky many times. And what you might find is that at some, some later time, uh, you return to a, to a given galaxy and you see that there's a bright uh, flash of light, a supernova. And there's a certain class of supernova, type 1a supernovae, uh, that are explosions of known intrinsic luminosity. So in particular, the peak brightness of this type of supernova is about 10 to the 36 watts. Uh, if you know the intrinsic luminosity uh, of this supernova, you can take the observed flux at the Earth, and you can use that to estimate a distance. And if you know the distance, then you can compute the light travel time uh, from when the supernova exploded. So basically, if you know that light is traveling at about 300,000 kilometers per second, uh, you can try to estimate how long it took for the light from that distant supernova to reach you. The second observable that you have is the redshift, basically the, sh the shifting of the spectral lines, for example. Um, and in an expanding universe, that redshift tells you the size of the universe when the supernova exploded. So effectively, from each one of these supernova, you get a, basically a time, an age of the universe, and a relative size of the universe. So if we go back to our Hubble diagram, we can uh, imagine sort of relabeling these axes uh, uh, such that the distance axis is now telling you about the age of the universe, and the apparent recession speed, or the redshift, is telling you the size of the universe. And in fact, if you look at supernova over a range of different distances, this allows you to trace out the expansion history of the universe. So a couple interesting comments here. Uh, one is that, oh, sorry. Uh, the slope of this relation uh, tells us the matter energy density of the universe. This arises from general relativity. Uh, it turns out that the current value is equivalent to about six protons per cubic meter in terms of the, the energy density. So that's one interesting uh, reason to measure, measure this expansion rate. Uh, a second motivation is that the inverse of the slope, uh, which has units of time, uh, actually tells us the approximate age of the universe. And so if you take this value of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and you basically trace when, when would the universe have you know, been at the point of the Big Bang, 
uh, you would estimate that the age of the universe is about 14 billion years. And that's actually quite, quite close to the, to the more precise uh, value. The other interesting thing is that it turns out that the rate of the expansion has actually changed throughout cosmic history. And this starts really getting at all the interesting physics that we can get out of this relationship. So the next couple slides are going to show a series of plots getting a little bit more uh, quantitative and try to get at really sort of the physics motivation for why we would want to understand the expanding universe in detail. Uh, so this particular plot on the horizontal axis is showing uh, the size of the universe, and this is on a logarithmic scale. So on the far right hand side of this plot, uh, this would be the size of the universe today. And then the far left hand side of the plot would be uh, when the universe was 10,000 times smaller than it is today. And you can see that because we're in an expanding universe, I've marked out a couple different key epochs, right? An age of around six uh, giga years ago, six billion years ago. Um, and then at the time of the cosmic microwave background, this was when the age of the universe was about, uh, about 400,000 years old. The vertical axis here is the expansion rate. So this is telling us how quickly the universe uh, was growing. And the interesting thing here is that we see these three different regimes where there has been uh, a slope change. And we can actually associate these different, uh, different epochs of the universe when the universe was expanding at different rates is corresponding to three different periods when the dominant form of matter and energy in the universe uh, basically came from different different components. And so we have a radiation dominated period, a matter dominated period when the galaxies were growing, and then the most recent period where dark energy has taken over. So it turns out that these three components, the reason why we have these different epochs in the universe is that the density of matter and energy uh, in these three different components it changes for each one of the different components. Basically, they have different uh, rates in which the density is reduced as the universe expands. So in particular, you'll see that uh, the radiation drops off most quickly, and this is why uh, the radiation becomes you know, a subdominant uh, factor in, in controlling the expansionist of the universe uh, after only a few hundred thousand years. Uh, then there's this long period where, where matter, the matter density is falling off, and this is falling off as you expect uh, with the volume. The really curious component here is the dark energy. And here you see as the universe expands, the density in dark energy just stays the same. Right? So we don't, this is very unusual. We don't know of any other substance that behaves this way. Another way of thinking about this is that this dark energy just has a constant equivalent density and the energy density is equivalent to about four protons per cubic meter in our universe. That's the approximate measured value. So it turns out that if you were to look at the fraction of the total energy density in these three different components, it's actually changing quite a bit over the history of the universe. Um, again, we have this period where radiation was dominant in the early universe, this long period, you know, many billions of years where the matter density was, was the largest energy, uh, matter energy component. Um, and then most recently, uh, we have the dark energy taking over. So the amazing thing about all of this uh, is that all the observations we have from the present day uh, ranging all the way to about one second after the Big Bang can be explained by a relatively simple cosmological model. And I mean simple in the sense that it has uh, very precise predictions and is only controlled by a few, uh, a free, a few free parameters that, that we can measure experimentally. The thing is, is that this model though, uh, it has five distinct lines of evidence for new physics, dark matter, dark energy, massive neutrinos, inflation, in the matter antimatter asymmetry. And so in some ways I, I liken the period that we have now to maybe uh, around the period of around 1900 in the history of physics where we had made a tremendous amount of progress and in many ways had a model that was very successful uh, in explaining diverse phenomena. At the same time there's this revolution on the horizon that 
fundamentally changed our understanding of matter, energy, and space and time. In the year 1900, that revolution was going to come in the form of quantum mechanics and of, and of general relativity. And, you know, in the next 10 years or maybe longer, uh, maybe, this, maybe these five lines of evidence will point us to some new revolution in physics that, again, uh, makes, us realizing, makes us realize that maybe we weren't even asking the right questions. So this is all uh, significantly compelling uh, that there are hundreds of scientists around the world uh, that are planning to use data from the Rubin Observatory uh, to try to measure this expansion history of the universe and then to learn about what, what new physics that might be telling us. Um, and so this is a, a picture um, from a recent collaboration uh, meeting of the Dark Energy Science Collaboration, which is one of the, uh, one of the eight science collaborations that are, that are planning to use Rubin, Rubin data. And so there's actually many different ways of trying to study the expansion history. Uh, supernova continue to be uh, one of the really exciting uh, techniques that we use. And so the reason why this is a challenge experimentally is that these type 1a supernova occur about once per century in a large galaxy like the Milky Way. And so you'd have to wait a long time if you're only looking at one galaxy. Uh, but the, uh, but the Rubin Observatory's Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST, uh, we will be monitoring something like 10 billion galaxies over a period of 10 years. And that means that we'll be able to get a sample of something like 1 million uh, type 1a supernova. They're actually spanning uh, billions of years of cosmic time. And so we can really trace out uh, this expansion of the universe in exquisite detail at about the 1% level. And we're hoping that that will give us this new, new insight into the laws of physics. So let me stop here. Uh, I've posted just a couple frequently asked questions about the expanding universe, but I'll, I'll pause here and see if there's any, any questions I can help answer. Keith, in the chat um, box, we had a question is, how do we know that all type 1a supernovae have the same brightness? So actually we know that they do not have all the same brightness, uh, but rather, we can look at information about the, the time evolution, basically how quickly the supernova gets bright and how quickly it fades away again in order to calibrate uh, the luminosity of, of, the, of the type 1a supernova. And even then we know that with this calibration, there is still a scatter. Basically, if you take any given supernova, we can only estimate its luminosity at about the 10% level right now. And so that is one reason why the Rubin Observatory is excited, you know, what, why, why we've sort of designed it in a way to collect many, many supernovae, because we have to uh, essentially know that there's a statistical uncertainty, but if we look at million, you know, something like a million supernova, we'll be able to calculate on average, you know, what was the distance of supernova at a given time in the universe. And so it really becomes a statistical measurement um, because we know that one supernova isn't going to be enough. Okay, we've got a couple of, we have actually quite a few questions coming through. Um, could you speak a little to the current discrepancies between, and I apologize, I'm a writer, it's H underscore zero values. Uh, yes, <laughs> so this is, this has actually become one of the, the hot topics in cosmology research uh, today is that, so let me, I think it'll actually help if we go back to, um, which plot, sorry. If we go back to this plot. So there's actually multiple different ways of measuring the expansion history of the universe. I, I focused on the type 1a supernova just for the sake of, of clarity to, to sort of focus on one particular probe that was associated with the lesson uh, today. But there's multiple different ways of measuring the expansion history of the universe. And it's a very interesting question to look at these different methods and see if they give a consistent answer. Because if the different if the different ways of measuring the expansion of the history of the universe give us different answers, then it could tell us that maybe the whole paradigm that we've been working in has some kind of, of, of flaw or needs some sort of adjustment 
um, and that would that would give us new new insight. And so, in particular, the 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 tension or apparent tension that that seems to exist in, in the current measurements is that there are methods that look at the expansion history of the universe basically by looking at at galaxies in the relatively uh, low redshift or, or near time, you know, sort of in the recent past, basically trying to directly measure what is the expansion rate of the of the universe today, right? So it's sort of at, at relatively near times. But then there are also a set of methods. Uh, that try to look at the very early history of the universe, in particular looking at the cosmic microwave background or the particular pattern of density perturbations that were laid down at the time of the cosmic microwave background and that basically control how galaxies are distributed in the universe today. And what we can do is that we can, we can look at, at the, the data from the cosmic microwave background from this very, very early period of the universe and basically forward predict what we would expect the expansion rate of the history to be today. And it turns out that those two different numbers, basically that what you would predict from the time of the, of the cosmic microwave background from the early universe and what we measure today, uh, they differ by, you know, some, something on the order of, of uh, five to six percent, something like this. But the quoted precision of these measurements is sort of at the one to two percent level. And so it's an indicator that, that maybe, maybe there's something different in the physics of the early universe and the late time universe that we don't understand. At the same time, it could be potentially a, an indicator that there's some sort of, uh, some sort of way that we've done our measurements, some way that we've calibrated our data that could be slightly off. Because again, we're trying to make these measurements at the one percent level, and so that's one reason why scientists are so excited about through an observatory is because it potentially gives us another set of handles to try to uh, understand that discrepancy, or at least apparent discrepancy. Thanks, Keith. Okay, so uh, Ian Gray asks, so how do you feel about the flat versus curved debate right now? Oh, I, I would say that the, I would say that the overwhelming evidence is for a, a universe that is quite flat. That's not to say that it couldn't have some deviations from flatness, but those deviations would have to be at the level of about the part per thousand or, or less. Um, and in particular, there's also sort of good theoretical reasons to think that the universe is very close to flat, uh, because as the universe has been expanding over billions of years, any deviations from flatness grow dramatically. And so we basically tried, tried to understand this in terms of setting the initial condi conditions of the universe in a way that almost guarantees that the universe is very close to flat. And so this is part of the, uh, the inflation, this evidence of new physics that I, that I mentioned. And so I would say that it's, it's definitely a topic that we will continue to investigate and, and try to make more precise measurements. But as of right now, there's, there's no, I wouldn't say there's any, within the precision of all experiments that exist today, there's no indications that the universe has, has a measurable curvature. All right, um, we've got time for one, maybe two more. Um, so do you expect the LSST data to resolve the Hubble tension or might there be some kind of systematic error? I think that the, I think that the, that the Rubin data will be one piece in the sense that there are multiple different ways of measuring uh, the, the expansion history, the, you know, this uh, Hubble constant, right? That's, that's the expansion rate of the universe today. But ultimately, it is probably going to require other instruments as well, in part because you really want to have these measurements directly from the early universe. You know, not, not only, so basically, if you look at a galaxy survey like, like Rubin, you sort of get the most direct measurements in the, in the sort of in the, in the past, say, 10 billion years or so. But we would also really like to have these measurements in the early universe. 
Rubin can get at that early universe information in an indirect way by looking at the baryon acoustic oscillations, which is you know this this pattern of how galaxies were distributed, you know how matter was distributed uh, at the time of the cosmic microwave background. So I think Rubin is a really important part of the whole story, but it's gonna it's gonna take other observatories as well. All right, I'm gonna do one more and then we need to move on because we need to give everyone a little time for a break. But the question is, is there a way to see how the universe looks right at this present moment or can we only ever see the past? Ah, uh, we can only see the past. And th this is because uh, light travels at a speed of you know, about 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. So when we look at the nearest stars, we're seeing them as they were a few years ago. When we look at the nearest galaxies, we're seeing them as they were, say, a million years ago. And in some ways, this is actually a beautiful, amazing thing, like a gift that the universe has given us, that when we look far away, we also look back in time, right? It gives us this opportunity. It's almost like being archeologists, right? That, that we can see how, how the universe has changed. And so I, I'm actually like super, uh, delighted and grateful that our universe works out this way, that, that we can see the whole history. Um, that's one of the amazing things that, uh, that we can do.